Well, hello, everyone. Welcome to day two of DevOps Days. How was day one? Yeah? How many people are repeats from last year? How many people are new? I love it. I love it. That's, that's a great number. I love how many new people there are. Um, I had a great time coming last year. I'm really excited to be here again. I'm sorry I missed the first day. I, you know, you're just you're flying around. I promised I took the fastest way to get here. It wasn't very fast. Um, so my name is Spencer Crowe, and I'm here to talk to you about like, kind of some bigger ideas that are actually still formulating. So um, feel free to sort of expand your mind a little bit with this. Um, my job is a developer advocate for IBM. I focus on containers and Kubernetes. Um, if you'd like to talk about containers and Kubernetes, find me after. I'd be happy to show you some stuff we're doing over at IBM. Um, but this talk is about eSports. So who kind of has like a sense of what I mean when I say eSports? Who doesn't? Who, put your hand up if you've never heard of this eSports thing. Okay, there's a few people. Okay. I'm going to try to bring it all the way down and, and share, and hopefully we'll get there together. So what is eSports? Well, eSports is competitive video game. Um, you know, a lot of games actually allow you to compete uh, player versus player, not just player versus environment. Some of those games become extremely popular. Some of those ones that are become popular, they end up with some kind of a global ladder system. So you really have the top 100 players. You sort of know who they are. Once you have that kind of large pool of players playing against each other, a meta develops, and you start getting strategies that are well tested and have known counters. And um, the real top skill players identify themselves. So how do we get here? Well, it kind of starts in South Korea in the late 90s. So in the I don't know all the history, but in like the late 80s, early 90s, Korea had a bit of an economic stumble. And as part of the rebirth or the, the rejuvenation of the country from that, the government paid for a large um, infrastructure grant to work on internet. So the country was wired for high-speed internet and peer-to-peer and -peer internet before kind of the rest of the world was. And that was good. Then there's this other component of what was going on at the time where um, Korean-Japanese relations um, weren't that solid. So whereas Americans were often buying consoles, like most of the console manufacturers were in Japan. So um, Korean kids and stuff were not interested in that kind of stuff. And so in 1996, 1998, when Blizzard Entertainment released StarCraft Brood War, it was an instant hit. And Brood War had this nice, uh, it's my first game. Um, that's the nicest thing about it. But, and there were games that came before Brood War as well. But one of the things that Brood War nailed the first before anybody else, and it's kind of its claim to fame, and his many claims to fame, was that it was the first one you could really play over the network with your buddy. Um, you could play maybe next to each other. You could play Doom or Quake or something. But over the internet, it was Brood War. And so out of nowhere, there's this ladder system, like we're talking about, where everybody in South Korea has a ranking, and you can see it back and forth. And then from that ranking comes tournaments. And then the tournaments start out in high school gyms. And then they get bigger. And then they get bigger. And then they get bigger. And eventually, you end up where we are today, where you can kind of define a, a large esports event as having a $500,000 cash prize pool. Um, it will probably have $250,000 of that. It's American. So like multiply it by like 14 or something, you get Rand. Um, you know, maybe $250,000 will go to the winner, maybe $100,000 to the like, second place, and then the people below that sort of get little smaller pieces of money. Um, for a game like StarCraft II in 2017 um, that's trying to make sure that the, the competitive scene stays alive because it's a little bit less popular, what they try to do is make sure that even somebody like the round of 32, if you got that far, you're going to get about $1,000. And the thinking there is that $1,000 is kind of that minimum amount of you, it, it, minimum amount of money to win where it's like, okay, it was worth it for me to buy a plane ticket to Memphis and a couple days in a hotel room. Like, I made my money back. It was worth it for me to go. Um, and so you, you take the entire scene of people who are playing this game. They all compete. They complete some online qualifiers. They go to the next game. They go to the tournament. If you make it into the round of 32, you've got $1,000 in your pocket. You make it to the first spot or the second spot, you have six-figure salaries. You've got to pay real taxes on that. It's unfortunate. <laughs> so this guy, his name is Semphis. He's from Cloud9. Um, I knew the cloud would come in at some point. Uh, so these players, really, most of them who, who do it, they identify themselves as a pro gamer, 
which is programmer with one less letter. Um, <laughs> you have no idea how many times I typo this in my daily life. Um, and so like, what that means is, is uh, sometimes that means nine to 10 hours a day playing video games. Sometimes that means long hours on planes. Um, it's really not that different than sort of the soft, there's a lot of parallels I'm going to try to draw between the software industry and this, this gaming thing. And it's going to be, I just, just bear with me a little bit, you know, no speaker's ever said that before. So let's talk about what a big, we talked a little bit about what a big tournament looks like. A big tournament is $500,000. The biggest tournament in competitive esports right now, there's some room for argument, but the biggest one is called the International. It's, it's uh, the Dota 2 tournament put on by Valve. It's in Seattle. And as a, this year was a more than $20 million prize pool. Um, they sold out the key arena in Seattle where the Supersonics used to play, 22,000 seats. Um, I personally looked at Twitch, and, and it looks like about 750 million, or 750,000 people watched at peak concurrently. And then Dota, Valve, and Dota claim that tw 25 million people watch the broadcast at some point during its two week run. So for context of what 25 million people means in sports, the NBA Finals, not that you really care about that, but the NBA Finals <laughs> gets about 15 million. So this is a huge claim. This is, this is some real stuff here. So obviously we brought a hype video to show Wings is drafting scholars that you don't know what they're going to do. But there is a plan for this. There has to be. They're innovative. They're experimental. They're pushing the game to the limit. Get, get hyped for esports, OK? Find the secondary one in the Naga. Soxa, he needs to get out of the damage. So what we're watching here is a hype video kind of covering what happened at the International Six. Um, which was the 2016 tournament. Um, unfortunately, uh, one of the teams gets completely swiped out by the other one, but that happens. You can see that there's crowds, there's announcers, there's emotion. They actually go do locker room stuff. Um, it's like a real sport. Uh, you see little flashes of Dota. I'm trying not. I'm gonna try not to show too many video game clips, but we're gonna have to see them. Oh, the salt, salt, salt flows. Poor guys. Wings are so close. One victory will do it. Digital chaos. Um, so this is Dota 2. You can see they have so much money they hired an orchestra to play in the middle. They've got Taylor Swift uh, wristbands. Um, the booth they're playing in is a soundproof booth, so that the players who are playing don't don't hear the crowd noise and get any insight into the game that they wouldn't already know. Um, as the crowd loses it because of like a secret play or something. You don't want the, the others to know. Do they play safe? Do they back it up? No! In they go! Resolution! Welcome back and goodbye! The buybacks, it won't be enough to game of play! Wings are your international 2016 champion! And they've got fireworks, and they've got explosions, and then they're gonna hold up a big trophy. It's a lot of fun. So that's the international. That's the biggest of the big. Um, we will get to DevOps, I promise. Um, just, you know, a little bit more. So that was Dota 2. There are two other games I really want us. Oh, whoop, we need to. Thanks for whoever did that. Uh, maybe, maybe. There we go. Um, so there's two other games we should cover, CSGO and StarCraft 2. StarCraft, Dota, CSGO, and League of Legends are the biggest games. StarCraft is my favorite, so it's the best, but far from the biggest. Um, this is like a brief, we're, we're not going to watch that many videos, but this is a brief example of what StarCraft sort of looks like. It's um, a 1v1 game instead of a 5v5 game. Um, and because you're, control, you're controlling like a whole army. And so the idea is you're going to go get these resources, you're going to use the resources to build an economy, once you have the economy in place, you're going to build an army, and you're going to go try to kill your buddy. Um, so what we're going to see here is, is there's kind of this two-pronged attack as red tries to come into blue, and blue's going to actually push red out quite easily because the blue player is named Stats, and he's really, really good at the game. Um, 
so this this is what the battle sort of looks like. They're like shooting at each other and things are exploding and you know. Um, and as you can see, this red, uh, red assault has been completely neutralized. No problems. The other one, and, and I just apologize in advance, this is, a, this is a little violent. This is CSGO, which is a shooting game. And this is a tactical game of five versus five. And you can see they're in those booths. And you can see that there's a smaller crowd here, but still an exciting crowd. Um, and again, there's, there's silence around the, the booth, and, the, and they use headphones and a booth that's soundproof to kind of maintain the secrecy of the game. Um, and the point of Counter-Strike, which is what we're watching here, which is what CS stands for, is that it's a 5v5 and five people are trying to go plant a bomb and five people are trying to stop them from doing it. And there's a timer at the top of the map and when the timer cr uh, goes all the way down, um, the, uh, the bomb planting uh, team has lost. In this case, what we're gonna see is they're gonna throw a lot of what's called utility, which are these smoke and, and fire grenades to try to control the flow. And then the other team is, is basically going to completely fall apart. Uh, the blue team is going to completely fall apart on this one. And then, interestingly, what, what they're going to do is they're going to do something called a save. And the save actually comes important later. In CSGO, it's a round-based game. So you start out with a certain amount of resources every time, but it's not that much. And so the resources you can take from round into the next round give you an advantage. And so rather than try and go, go out in a blaze of glory and lose all your, all your stuff. The best is to go hide in a corner of the map and wait for the round to end so you can take it into the next one. Um, all right, that's about, we're gonna talk about DevOps now. All right, so most people have some form of their job related to software engineering in this group. It's sort of my, my game, you know. Software engineering is kind of fun to say just because it applies to everybody, whether you're kind of on the operations side or on the development side. My background is I, I was on, a CI operator for a long time, and before that, I, I hit Solaris servers with a wrench, right? Um, and so, when when you think about your job, do you think that you, you know, I would identify myself as somebody who types on a computer a lot. I would say I'm probably in the one percent, the top one percent of computer users, and I worry about my wrists. Um, and I think that probably you do as well. But then you think about these players that we're talking about, these players that play the games. They're playing nine, ten hours a day. Um, the, the ones on the more professional teams live in a house together. It's like camp. They have bunks, bunk beds, and they go and they, they play. They just walk across the hall and they play their games for ten hours. And then they turn in their time sheets and they go home. They go back into their bunk. Um, it's not a good work-life balance, but it absolutely does show us what happens to your body when you press that many keys strokes that many times. Um, so this... Professional StarCraft players will sometimes hit 200 actions per minute, which means 200 clicks or keyboard presses in a single minute, and they'll keep that at, they'll keep that at an average and burst to 300 or something. And what that does to your body is this. So this is Bion, who's one of the best StarCraft players in the world, and he's getting interviewed right before he goes and wins like the global finals. Like, I'm, he's really good. And he's showing his gamer bump, which is like a callus. It's not actually a wound, it's just a callus from his mouth going like this. And during this interview, he's telling Yuri, which is the woman that's interviewing him, he says, I practiced so much yesterday, I practiced so much this week, I practice until it bleeds and then I bandage it and I go to bed for the night. Um, so how do you, so I'm just saying, we can get even closer. <laughs> so how do we optimize the physical working environment in our offices, in our, in, our, in our groups trying to engineer software? How do we optimize, how do we take these lessons and make, um, make it better. And so those bumps are actually not uncommon. They're not, almost every pro gamer has one, but also so do like people who are serious about ballet. Um, you, you, that's the way the body responds to repeated pressure. Um, and so what you have to do, whether you're a pro gamer or a software engineer, is you need to manage that level of injury. Like you don't want to go out and write code with an injury. You don't want to play games with an injury. If you miss work, or injure yourself more because you tried to get the sprint done, you're basically in the same place as somebody who said, I'm gonna play this last match and then completely blows out their wrist and can't play for an entire season. And so there's a couple things that people do in the gaming world to make sure that they do not uh, suffer undue injury to their wrists or whatever. And so the first one, which you can take home right to your office is just pretty obvious, is let your employees, or if you're an employee, advocate to your manager, like. You should have whatever equipment you want. Like if you want a Kinesis keyboard, you should have it. If you want this thing, which is the Black Widow Tournament Edition 2014, which is what I use, 
you should have that. Um, almost no one in the gaming community uses like the fancy keyboards that we use in the like operations community, like the Kinesis or the Happy Hacking or the DOS keyboard, but I'm sure there'll be crossover in the future. The second thing that, that programmers are starting to use is called, uh, the, the second thing they're using is called elastic therapeutic tape, which basically looks like that. And you might have seen this in like a gym or a yoga studio, but it basically works the same way as kind of like a brace. You can physically restrain the muscles and by, by touching the, by, by putting this tape skin stuff on to make sure that your, your body doesn't go out of whack. Now don't just go buy it on eBay and like start slapping yourself on, like go find a professional that can do something. But you know, for an engineering group of any appreciable size, it's really not that expensive to have a physical trainer or a physical therapist come down for a couple hours and show you how to use this kind of stuff. Um, personally, I'm a big fan of the manicure. This doesn't come from eSports, but um, <laughs> honestly, like for the, anybody who hasn't had a manicure, there's like a, like a they do stuff that's not just paint your nails. They like clean out all this dead skin that you don't want that I didn't even know I was supposed to remove. Um, and typing on a keyboard after a manicure feels amazing to the point where I get them regularly now. And so similarly to the tape, it's like just, you know, if you have more than maybe 10 people working on a computer every day in your office, just once a month, have some manicurist come down and set up shop in the break room, pay them well, and give anybody, it, you will never stop going every month, I promise. <laughs> um, as long as we're talking about CSGO, uh, you see how that, let's talk about this angle of the keyboard. So this is how Counter-Strike players play with this, that keyboard at that angle. It's not like a temporary place. They, they literally put it there. Um, and there's quite a bit of debate about why. Uh, it's now done basically because the people who were good now, like two years ago did it, so the people who are trying to get good now do it. But where this came from is kind of a topic of some debate. The, the biggest, there's no, you're not better because of that, and it's not better for your hands because you do that. The best explanation that exists is that in the old, old days, there were LAN parties, and everybody had keyboards with 10 keys on them, and there wasn't a lot of space. So if you didn't angle it like this, you and your buddy were too close to each other. Um, anyways. All right, let's talk about teamwork. So what do they do on, in, in uh, both, uh, Counter-Strike and in Dota that looks like what you can do in your team. Well, the first thing is there, there are five people in that booth and these Counter-Strike rounds are two minutes long. And at the end of those two minutes long, you immediately look to your right and you fist bump and you look to your left and you fist bump. And they, they congratulate each other. Win or lose, there's a little, there's a team little, there's a team little fist bump that makes us all know we're a sense of unity, we're working together. It's nobody's fault. It's a success, and I think, you know, when I'm working on engineering teams, we, we rarely do that. We're like, okay, who broke the build? And it becomes a little bit of a witch hunt to find who broke the build, and nobody's fist bumping. At, maybe we fist bumped that we found who broke the build. <laughs> right, so just take home, go home. You know, next time you work with your team, th try to think of how you can build a regular repetition of just, like, group congratulations and group thanks, right? This is what volleyball teams do before and after every point, right? This is what football teams do. This is what doubles partners do in tennis. It's not hard for us to do in engineering. The second thing they do is there's something in Dota 2 called the carry. And this applies a little bit more generally to teams working in sprints or teams that are made up of people of varying skill levels or parts of their career. And the carry is the person on the team that plays the role of early on in the game of Dota 2. They can't fend for themselves. They, they need to have a buddy with them helping all the time. And then halfway through, they start to be a little more self-sufficient. And at the end, they're powerful enough to, that they need that carry to be really powerful because at that point, that person is carrying the entire team. All right, and this, is, this, this immediately applies to when you have a junior intern or a junior person on the team that's trying to grow, right? We don't want them alone on the bug tracker, let alone the support queue. Um, on call, but then we need them to get to a place where they can fix the database when the rest of us are in, uh, you know, life stuff. Um, it also applies a little bit more broadly to when you're working on an agile team or any kind of a team that's working through iterations, and we're not all responsible for the same tasks, right? I don't know how many of you, I've certainly had a situation where the boss has been like, look, these are the four criteria we're all going to be 
graded on at the end of whatever. And not all of you are assigned to work on that. Some of you are basically assigned to work on the work that makes it so that the people who are assigned to one of those key performance indicators can work on those key performance indicators. So you've got to think about that in the concept of carry. How do we help people work on what they're trying to work on? How do we make sure we're, we're keeping that, that cube led down? Awkwardly low down here. Um, so in CSGO, like I said, after every point, it's turn to your right and fist bump, turn to your left and fist bump. Sometimes they get out of sync and it's a little awkward, but they figure it out and get it back together. <laughs> you got somebody hanging, you're just like, oh, poor guy. <laughs> All right, so there's another thing in CSGO. Remember we talked about how they have to save their equipment so that they have, you know. Basically in CSGO, the way it works is at every level, you, every round, you get a certain amount um, plus whatever you carried through the last time. If you win you get more, if you lose, you get less of that initial round. In, um, it's actually called money. Um, and so what'll happen, and anybody who's worked in Agile, you know, can r relate to this a little bit. Like, did the sprint go well or did it not go well, right? Because if the sprint went really well, we get there on Monday morning, we're like, all right, let's do some planning. What, who, who, what else is going on? What new features landed? Let's build some stuff. Let's go, let's go, let's go. But if it's, did, Sprint did not go well, it's like, oh, we still got to kind of fix that. That's, those bugs aren't done yet, right? Or all the, the work that is generally put into like keeping the lights on or is assigned to slack time, that stuff hasn't been touched at all because we didn't keep, meet our key deliverables. And so in Counter-Strike, what you do when you've lost a couple rounds and you don't have enough money to buy the equipment to win is you say, I give up. <laughs> we are not going to win this round. We're going to spend $200 and we're going to try something kind of funky, and it, it won't work. And then the next round will have enough so that we're in a good position to put up a real fight. And so you can do this at work. You can say, look, we didn't get our stuff done. There's no reason for us to just pile on another 27 t-shirts or 27 units or hours or however you're calculating it of, of work on the queue. You just say, look, look, we maybe need to be a week off the other teams this week, this, this cycle, or we need to take on drastically less work this week or we need to do something else, but we need to come up with a plan that doesn't involve just keep trying the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. So I take that home, think about how it w you can, maybe it'll work, maybe it won't. Okay, how many people are familiar with a speed run? Okay, less. Well, actually a lot of you raised your hand at the end there, good. So a speed run isn't really an eSport. Like eSport is kind of built around this idea of competition, but speed runs are built around the idea of single player games or games where you play against the environment in a deterministic fashion. And you're trying to get from the launching, you know, the beginning of the game to the like end credits as quickly as possible. And for titles that are loved by the nerds of the world, there's kind of a huge brain trust. There's a huge group of people trying to solve the puzzle that is how do I get through this. It's, it's kind of related to security and hacking and stuff. Um, we can watch an example of it on this video. So this is, um, I think it's muted, yeah. So there's a charity called Summer Games Done Quick, also called Awesome Games Done Quick, that every six months or so gets a couple of, gets a, a whole cadre of the world's best speedrunners together to run events. So in this case, they're running Super Mario 64 from like 1998 or whenever this came out. Um, and this was filmed in 2014, so they're playing a game they know is 20 years old. And the kind of the deal here is, like of the event, is they do these speedruns both for a live audience and for a Twitch audience, and they raise a bunch of money to help, in this case, Medicine Sans Frontier. Um, pardon my French. Uh, but then the idea here of what the guy with the controller is doing is he's trying to beat this game that usually takes somebody about a month to play. He's trying to beat it, and he, he thinks he can do it in under two hours, which is that estimate of two hours. And he has to use every exploit he can find in the game. He has to, um, uh, he, he's played it thousands of times himself. He knows exactly where to step. He knows exactly when to jump, how to get every little exploit out of this little system. But the thing I think has a relevance to the software industry, and specifically the DevOps community, is what happens at the very end. Because at the very end, there's a moment where he has won, but the game is not yet over. And they call that moment in speedrunning, they call that the clock stops. And it's the moment where the game kind of runs, and it does, but it does all these deterministic things that no longer require human intervention. So what ends up happening is 
for anybody who's into the Mario franchise, is he, he beats Bowser, and then he grabs this golden star. And then you'll see the clock at the top, which is his run time for the speed run. You'll see that stop, but then the game keeps going. And I think this has a big parallel with our CI systems that we build. And the question I would ask yourself is, at what point does the clock stop on our deployment pipeline, or our delivery pipeline, on our testing? When does it no longer need human intervention? When is it no longer it's been submitted and I'm waiting for some other team to take it? When is it truly hands off, it's gonna happen, we don't even have to look anymore? I mean, obviously there, there's errors, you should probably watch it, but at what point have we removed any, any place where we're waiting on someone else or waiting on a different team? And so what he's gonna do is he's gonna do some crazy Mario jumps and then he's gonna fight this big monster called Bowser and then he sh you, you'll actually see the um, you actually see the clock stop. And we're gonna turn on the music so because or not the music, the um, the audio, because you can hear him say it and it's Bowser really throws. Cool. Two frame window. So not bad, but not good. <laughs> How many of you have played this game? Four? Okay. He's making it look real easy. Let me put it out. Oh. <laughs> okay. All right. So the timer stops when I grab the big star. And so what happens from here, as you can see, is the game keeps going in its machinations, but the time has stopped. Human intervention is no longer required. So what I would think about when you go home is, is two things. Like one, how many steps are there in our whatever pipeline to providing customer value that I'm a part of? Like how many steps are there where I do some stuff, then a computer does some stuff, but then we're waiting on more humans? Because you want to minimize the amount of steps that you have just waiting on someone else to come into work and press a button. And the second thing is how much, you know, the, once you've put all the human stuff first, where is the point where it's no longer human intervention anymore? Do you know the pipeline well enough to say that? Can you talk about it? These are the things you should be thinking about. All right, there's one more example of about, about that. So StarCraft works in a different direction where it says there are things that we can't automate. In StarCraft, you're literally just not allowed to automate anything. So you have to do it manually. But there are things that we do manually that we can still look to eSports or sports in general for some guidance on. And the most common one is just to drill. Like it doesn't matter what it is. It shouldn't be the first time you're doing it when it goes to prod. It shouldn't be the third time. If you do it a lot and it needs to be human driven and you can't automate it for whatever reason, you can drill it. And after you've done some drills or whatever, you can put some, some instrumentation on it and get a, a real sense of its behavior. And so what we have here is actually a histogram I created out of some StarCraft plays. So StarCraft is a deterministic game with a lot of strategy. And what ends up happening is people build a thing at a certain second. It's something called a spawning pool. And you build that, you have to build it at some point in the game. And the StarCraft pros are so tightly tied to the build orders. They're so precise in what they do that you see the histogram doesn't really look like a curve at all. We have 25 out of 100 samples in this 10 second window because everybody is really crisp. And so for the, those processes in your enterprise or your, your job that are human driven, you can, you can think about how long it takes to do them, what, what success looks like. And think, think about it like you're running a football play. And when you use that kind of a mindset, how can you make it better? All right, so let's talk about unity and self-care. We're going back to CSGO for this one. By the way, I really appreciate y'all staying with me on this. I know this is kind of weird. Um, so the CSGO players, there are about 10 teams that are really at the top of the CSGO scene. And there's, of course, a whole cadre of people below that trying to get up into those, those 10 teams. But 
they have to go to tournaments every couple of weeks. And they fly, and then they go to a different tournament. And sometimes they win, sometimes they lose, and they fly, and they go to a different tournament. And remember, if you're not coming out in that one or two position, you're really not taking home a big slice of the pie. And your life is starting to fall apart, and you have no time to practice. And it's not built, because the people writing the checks for this kind of thing aren't in the interest of the best players. They're interested in how many Kit Kat bars we can sell, how much advertising for Mountain Dew we can push out, right? Because that's the business interest in keeping this thing alive. And so what happened this summer, or really, I guess, this spring, is some critical mass of those top 10 teams of the players themselves got together and they wrote a little memo to the industry at large and they said, we are taking a break from July 1 to August 1. We will not, the, the undersigned, you know, some 75% or whatever of the top talent are not going to go to a tournament in that month. We're calling it the players' break. And it's for our own needs. And all the tournaments were like, well, I guess, I mean, if you can't, because the tournament perspective is if we can't attract the top talent, then the viewers won't come either. So the tournaments had to, had to accept this. And that's a really cool statement, right, of, of, a, of a group of people coming together and saying, we won't help this. And what that makes me think of in the software, and I, this is not a rallying cry, but just <laughs> in the software industry, imagine, the parallel here is, is bosses saying, we need features, features, features. And people who are more in the trenches saying, we need stability, we need to update things, we need to do internal training. And so, just, this is not a rallying cry, but what if we, as a, just we got 75% of the people in the company or in the world or something, and we said, we will not push features in the month of July in 2018. No features, no companies can release any features. We're all gonna do internal trainings, we're gonna do communication, we're gonna patch systems that have never been patched, we're gonna work on stability, we're gonna backport things that need to be backported, right? It'd be interesting to see what the companies would do, because all of a sudden, all those things that are, those security vulnerabilities that are never getting looked at, the code that is just accruing technical debt, and this endless feature march, might be able to arrest it. <laughs> maybe, it's not a rallying cry. <laughs> maybe. So that's my pitch on eSports and DevOps. Hopefully some of those metaphors hit home. I really appreciate you giving me the opportunity to come out here and have a good rest of the conference.